Arc Poetry Magazine acknowledges that the land on which it operates is unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation have lived on this territory for millennia. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. Arc will honor the people and land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. We also honor all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. We also have some thanks. Arc is supported through funding from the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council and the City of Ottawa. We thank these funders for their support. Thanks also to Sean Wilson and everyone at the Ottawa International Writers Festival for partnering with us to launch this very exciting issue. And now for Brandon's introduction. Brandon Wint is an Ontario-born poet and spoken word artist who uses poetry to attend to the joy and devastation and inequity associated with this era of human and ecological history. Increasingly, his work on the page and in performance casts a tender but robust attention towards the movements and impacts of colonial capitalist logic and how they might be undone. In this way, Brandon Wint is devoted to a poetics of world making, world altering and world breaking. For Brandon, the written and spoken word is a tool for examining and enacting his sense of justice and imagining less violent futures for himself and the world he has inherited. For more than a decade, Brandon has been a sought after touring performer and has pre presented his work in the United States, Australia, Lithuania, Latvia, and Jamaica. His poems and essays have been published in national anthologies, including The Great Black North, Contemporary African Canadian Poetry from Frontenac House in 2013, and Black Writers Matter with the University of Regina Press in 2019. Divine Animal is his debut book of poetry. On a more personal note, I can say that Brandon is an amazing person to work with. His intelligence, deep knowledge, and general cheerfulness combine to make up the best kind of person. You'll love him. Hello everyone, hello poets, hello readers, hello friends, colleagues, lovers, poetry enthusiasts uh, around the world. Um, my name is Brandon Wint. I'm a poet and spoken word artist uh, currently based in Western Canada. And as you might know, I had the absolute pleasure of being the guest editor for the issue that we're celebrating today, which is Arc Poetry Magazine, issue 96, the Islands of Influence issue. And I just wanted to come to you briefly to talk about some of my intentions, some of my joys, some of my discoveries in trying to bring together uh, such a magazine. Um, again, as some of you may know, I am the son of a Barbadian mother and a Jamaican father. And so the idea of examining the notion of Caribbean Canadian culture or Caribbean Canadian intersection is something that's uh, more than near and dear to my heart because I literally owe my life <laughs> to, to such an intersection. Um, so in bringing together this Islands of Influence issue, um, I wanted to do exactly that, which is to say, I wanted to examine uh, the viability, the durability, the elasticity, the intrigue, the insight um, that could be garnered from uh, such a coming together, that is the coming together of uh, Canadian culture and uh, Caribbean cultures. Um, what was revealed to me is exactly what I thought, which is that um, there is a vast uh, expanse of brilliance emanating from Caribbean cultures and that brilliance is often literary, often poetic, often expressive, often uh, making its way stunningly onto the page. And, um, you know, my own family history evidences that there have been decades worth of um, migration and mingling between Caribbean cultures and Canadian culture. And that that mingling, that intersection, that confluence or that meeting of uh, Caribbean culture with Canadian culture uh, has produced so many uh, beautiful uh, expressions of yeah human brilliance and in particular literary brilliance. Um, I would not be, I would scarcely be a poet in the ways that I am a poet if not for the influence of people like Dion Brand, uh, Derek Walcott, 
Christian Campbell, uh, Claire Harris, uh, Lillian Allen, Afua Cooper, uh, the list goes on and on. And so my hope is that the Islands of Influence issue can exist um, cogently and snuggly, you know, can fit nicely uh, within the continuum of Caribbean Canadian literature, Caribbean Canadian cultural production, and can be a sort of uh, lighthouse or a landmark for those who um, might also be the son or daughter or child of uh, Caribbean influence and are looking for um, the imprint of their cultures in so-called Canadian literature. Um, and so this issue for me is uh, a dedication to those of my generation who, you know, whose, whose lifeblood emanates from Caribbean culture and Caribbean people. And um, I hope to have done justice and service and honor uh, to my elders and the poets and the writers who came before me in uh, creating a lineage of Caribbean Canadian writing. Um, so yeah, thank you to Art Magazine for allowing me to explore these things. And I hope that the, the work that you find in the pages of Art Issue 96 will be as pleasant for you to read as they were for me to help bring together. So thank you all for being here. I hope you enjoyed this launch. You're about to hear some absolutely wonderful poets. Uh, and there's so much more between the pages of that magazine. And so I hope that this will be um, an appropriate celebration of all of what is possible in Caribbean Canadian literature and all that is to come within that very same notion. Peace and love. Enjoy the event. It is also my honor and pleasure to uh, play the role of, of introducing um, some of the lovely readings that you're going to hear uh, during this launch event, uh, one of which is by Simone Dalton. Um, her piece, Banya Belly, uh, is, I don't know, absolutely spellbinding. Uh, there is there's such a depth of tenderness, a depth of craft, a specificity, just, just uh, an overall humanity in this piece that is um, absolutely necessary, um, deeply courageous, and uh, in the combination of craft and vulnerability, I would dare say that this piece is um, a piece of magic. And so um, congratulations to Simone. I was super, super grateful to be able to read this piece and to be able to have some contribution to editing it. And I hope you all enjoy hearing it. Thank you to Arc Poetry Magazine and Brandon Wind for this issue, Islands of Influence. I am honored to share space with all of the poets, writers, thinkers, Caribbean, Caribbean people in this issue and at the Ottawa International Writers Festival. This is Ban Yabeli. As snow squalls battened down much of North America's East Coast, the sky in Toronto remained mostly clear. It had been one of those unusually warm winters. December 16th, the four day morning hours are remembered for a skiff of snow that dusted the city. I remember that day as the one where my mother died in Trinidad while I slept. Quiet sounds of that hour, heartbeat, breath, wordless yearnings were disturbed by the shrill of a telephone in my bedroom. A clock radio on my bedside table read 3.15, or maybe it was 3.25 a.m. I did not know what was wrong, but I knew something was not right. Back where Lady of the Night Blooms sent the air that time of day, any phone call received after 9 p.m. starts with an apology. The web of sleep in my eyes dissolved. I lay on my back in bed with the top sheet tucked under my chin a counterproductive measure considering the lick of sweat on my neck. Dry heat pumped from the baseball heater in my bedroom. My body hugged the outer edge of the bed as though someone unwanted was beside me. I heard the muffled sounds of my father's voice on the other side of the wall our bedroom shared. He had answered the telephone and was engaged in an inaudible conversation. 
Maybe it was Granny. At 86, his mother was ready for Father God, even if her family was not. Determined, I squinted at my side of the wall, accented with the color of sage and sequined plumes from an old Caribana headpiece, willing his movers to unravel their message. We had begun mirroring each other, my father and I. This pattern was in plain view one lazy su summer Saturday morning, the eggs and toast eaten chased down with a cup of strong orange pico tea. I stood at the kitchen sink washing the dishes. He approached from the sometimes dining room with a pronouncement. I often thought of Sierra James when he was in that mood. Preoccupied with finding a suitable response, I turned to face him, face him and almost missed it. The carbon copying of our bodies, his limbs and gestures moved in chorus with mine. Our identical motions titrated to distill an amalgam of biology and genealogy. Of inheritance. The sight pulled me back to the countless times my mother had said, Lord child, you look like your father just now. Just now. The period of time is always slippery. When my mother said it those times, she meant that instant. In the kitchen that Saturday morning with my father, I stopped mid-sentence, finally seeing what she knew all along. Now the phone call meant that he too knew something that I missed. Long before long, his mm-hmm and mm songs lulled me into a dream. The mind can cover great distances, whole geography when it dreams. Years later, I read that at rest, the likelihood you will experience images, sensations, and ideas, the things that dreams are made of increases as the brain's activity slows down. Repressed urges, rationalizations, or messages being decoded as they are fired from neuron to neuron during our waking hours. These are some of the best guesses of what makes these sequences possible. Daydreams are different. Daydreams are fleeting moments of escape from our immediate reality. I woke up again, this time with the alarm, close to 6.30 a.m. The day ahead was promised to be light. A staff holiday luncheon and gift exchange were planned where I worked. I had been secretly matched with a vice president. Our interactions had been brief since I joined the organization earlier that year. And when she did speak to me, it was to debate the rules of grammar. So I was eager to present her with my token copy of the gift of the Maggie bought at a secondhand bookstore. I wanted to challenge her assumptions about me to prove my worth. I hoped O. Henry's short story would strike the right note. I moved through the main floor of the apartment with stillness, soothed by the hum of morning rituals. The kettle switch flicked on. I grazed against the kitchen window playing like a, like a lizard in the hopes of catching the warmth from the early morning sun. Winter had stripped the landscape behind the apartment building. The wall of tall grasses, weeds, and perennial shrubbery, a sound barrier separating us from the commuter train tracks, had long succumbed to the freeze and thaw. A thunder of industry sped across the tracks every 20 minutes or so at that hour. The rumbling of the boiling water and the lakeshore each train headed to Union Station met in a crescendo at 7 a.m. As if on cue, the pipes in the walls of the apartment came alive with my father's ablutions. I grew tense in the kitchen. The solitude of preparing and eating breakfast in the mornings was welcome and necessary since he retired earlier, a year earlier. It was a time free from deciphering his mood swings. He began walking down the padded staircase. Each step sounded as though he was not in a hurry to get to where he was going. I in turn began running through a checklist of my potential infractions that would cause him to get up that early. There had been many over the past six years I had been living with him. A forgotten soil sanitary napkin in the bathroom, high telephone calls, high telephone bills for my calls to Trinidad, going grocery shopping. He once bought me a box of cereal I said I was allergic to in an attempt to hide my distaste for freeze dried strawberries. He called me ungrateful when I asked him for the receipt to return the cereal to the store. I added this adjective to the list I had been collecting from him over the years. 
It included selfish and spoiled. He apparently called me A-plus shortly after meeting me, but I was a baby then. I was too emotional for him, too quick to cry. He never seemed to have patience with this soft tendency of mine. That morning, I tried to remember if I had forgotten dishes in the sink the night before. Morning greetings exchanged over my shoulder. I turned to face him, thinking small talk would soften the blow. I do cry often. I cry in airports, at church, at birthday parties. I cried when a friend told me she was pregnant with her first child and again when she told me her marriage was over. I once cried over a plate of stewed chicken, white rice and plantains in a jealous fit directed at my mother's mister. My sobs then felt just as powerful as the night. I cried when I heard the sounds of her love making with the same man. The thoughts made me lightheaded as I walked towards my father in the dining room. He stood at an arm's length distance from me, holding on to the back of one of the dining table chairs, barefooted and uncharacteristically disheveled. Mummy died, he said. His tone was low, as though the words remained trapped in his trachea. Sleep lingered on his breath. Drops of water glistened at the edge of his chin. The air grew thick. Mummy died, he repeated. His words, now suspended between us, lingered, looking for me. There was a misfire between what I heard and what I was able to feel. A laugh became a cough, a sign of the breath being snatched from my body, which soon turned my mouth into a question mark. My arms were next. They shot skyward in an awkward plea. Eventually, when no rescue appeared, I rested my clenched fist on my father's chest and fell into him. He half scooped, half dragged me across to the couch. The red, green, and gold bag with the gift of the Maggie crumpled beneath us. I curled into his body just conscious enough to hear the wailing when it started coming up from the deepest part inside of me, a motherless child. When I was a child, I told my mother childish things in the double bed we shared until I was 23. I turned to her side where the sweat-stained mattress gave way under her weight. I buried my face in the flesh of her arm as a younger child would reach for a breast. Sunlight filtered through the curtains, cast shadows from the neighbor's Dudu's mango tree. They danced on the ceiling to a cock's crow and the crackle of leaves from an iguana. The room became a mangrove that swayed with the rhythm of the morning breeze. Her eyes closed. She pulled me into her warmth, ready to answer with the cadence of her breath. I told her what I wanted to be when I grew up and she was entertained by my predictions. They were dreams undeterred by the necessary simplicity of our life. This was before the termites had eaten through the floorboards in the bedrooms, adjacent to the one we slept in. Before the hairline cracks in the foundation of the house were wide enough to let the breeze whisper through. She was seemingly undeterred by our crumbling house and recounted my childish chatter to all who would listen. We talked about all of these things until the shadows disappeared. For a moment, in the quiet rhythm of my father's heaving chest, I retreated to what fell shore. What I knew for certain was a slip of moss in the canal, the crash of full avocados through underbrush, the sickly sweet of overripe guavas, the give of pitch softened by relentless sun. Within, more pressing matters began to rise to the surface to a place where a reality as bitter as aloe lay in wait, writhing. What I didn't know was where, when, and how exactly my mother had died. Precision, facts, would mean regaining control of the untamable. On the other hand, an interrogation seemed impossible, mocked by the distance between my mother and me. Sometime the night before, Call your mother. It was a singular directive, but I tried to distance myself from it anyway. I changed out of my work clothes, turned on the television in my bedroom, and numbed myself with a fix of remote control buttons. Unwanted, my cell phone lay next to the day's discarded pile of details. I had nothing to say to her. Nothing every day, not on that day. Nothing that was not couched by my need for at least an acknowledgement of a two-year-old conversation that led us to speaking in a tongue called pleasantries. 
In that old conversation, I told her I was growing to love a woman. The revelation tested our relationship and the results still felt inconclusive. What should Benissa tell me? She demanded over the phone then. And the sea between us turned into an ocean. She was grounded into the shore and I was suspended in the undertow fighting to get back. I can't talk to you right now, she said. This frightened me. This was different from all of our disagreements. This sounded like her shutting down, shutting me out. She followed with a confirmation of love after I asked for it, but her last words cut to the quick. I raised a total woman. She hung up, I called back, intent on retracting what carelessly escaped from my lips. I tried to swallow the words on my second try. I told her she was right. I did not know what I was saying. For two years and for every call since, the conversation remained in the thick of my thoughts. One day, it even waited with me at the edge of the Queen Street subway platform beyond the yellow line. It'll be better for both of you this way. Still, with nothing to say and the slow burn of a memory, I muted the television and called. We never stopped talking, loving, but it was not the same. It was not us. She picked up where she left off with ease and charm. She had spent the day on a pre-Christmas shopping trip with a friend, filling her car with excessive quantities of bounty paper towels and carnation evaporated milk, which she also described as trippiness. Then she said she was going to rest her head. She was tired, so tired. Thank you. You know, um, by now I've said it many times, but it is absolutely true. Um, it was an honor and a pleasure, um, something that I, I don't take for granted um, to welcome each and every one of these poems and poets uh, into the pages of ARC Poetry Magazine, issue 96. Uh, in the case of the poet that I'm about to introduce you to, uh, it was an honor uh, because I deeply respect this poet's combination of you know, uh, lyrical power and insight, as well as um, what seems to be a prevailing humility that she carries uh, in everything she does, despite the fact that her debut collection um, was one of the most heralded books of the year. Um, she is another person who I would call uh, a literary darling of the moment, um, in the sense that uh, her debut book was much anticipated and uh, much beloved by readers across the country and perhaps across the world. Uh, the poet that, I like, that I'd like to introduce you to now is uh, Juni De Sil. Uh, Juni is, yeah, just one of the best, one of the best we have, uh, a poet of Haitian descent who brings the complexity of, of uh, that diasporic journey, that, that um, Haitian inheritance uh, to bear in a wonderful poem called Untethered uh, which is actually the poem that opens um, the issue. Uh, please join me in welcoming and celebrating the great Juni de Sil. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me for ARC 96's inaugural launch this evening. I am reading virtually from the territories of the Chatlich. First Nations, otherwise known as Seychelles in British Columbia. My name is Jeannie Desil, and I will be reading from uh, this issue, my piece, uh, Untethered, as well as other places, including from my debut collection, Eat Salt, Gaze at the Ocean. Untethered. I know only three islands, Montreal, Mother, an island encircled by disappointments, home, macerated in memories and rituals. Peel the skin of an apple in a long, unbroken spiral. The sound of the sharp knife lifting crisp flesh, tiny droplets of the fruit's juice landing on eyelid, corner of mouth, countertop. Place the peel on a saucer and pull the salt shaker full of pink crystals, twist, grind, shake onto the peels, quarter, then have the quarters, salt them, 
something Lama did as well. Mangles too. Home. To make rice and beans, measure up the beans, run fingers through, sink in their smooth coolness. Find pebbles, dirt, and other non-bean items. In a colander holding the beans, run cold water several times till it runs clear, then let it soak. Same with rice. Boil the beans seemingly all day in a heavy bottomed pot. Drain winter, watch the window panes shed tears that sluice down the glass. Drapes cling wetly, obscuring the outside, but don't open the windows. The icy draft on barely covered backs will bring on a cold. Macerated. I have a bowl of chicken being washed, halved lemons, their citrus brightness fills the kitchen, salt, metal bowl, scrub and squeeze all at once inside and outside the cavity. Repeat with all the halves. Don't tell me about science and spreading salmonella. The sink gets bleached before and after washing chicken. A ritual. It's how mother infuses island flavor of the courtyard chickens she tended back home when she landed in the place broken in two. She did not eat the cold white chicken. For months, she did not eat in memories and ritual. To cool off during summer's short homage to the home I have never been to. Pull up my dress from my feet Spread my thighs and hips, let the fabric waterfall between my legs. Have a towel in hand to flick across damp shoulder blades, cool, like mother would during the dry prairie hot spell. Green floral towel creating a breeze. Islands, Montreal, mother and island encircled by disappointment to exist untethered from home. I'm going to read another piece um, entitled Pear Butter. Pear Butter. Pears pass their time, perfume the kitchen, threaten an envahissement of fruit flies. Carve time to make pear butter, decide not to post my pear butter accomplishment, an accomplishment I don't document. That time in between not doing, after all, too much doing, spinning the nonprofit industrial complex wheel. These days I approach time with trepidation to never know if the time for too much doing is not enough, is drug enough capitalist imperialist measuring system so pear butter in the crock pot simmers along with cinnamon mace and ginger i cringe wondering if i've made another failed project of being domestic in the time of pandemic amidst the 99 urgent ones amidst the urgent global crises climate change and pipelines through stolen land and black lives and all the black lives that get forgotten and sometimes cry laugh at a quickly scrolled through memes about murder hornets, locust plagues, ants, who selected those on their 2020 bingo card and the violence of defending one's life. It would seem that pear butter spiced and simmered and tasted its cinnamon brown warm spread is trite perhaps and still I embrace the scent of a spice hub, a strange disconnected coping, stockpiling and gardening in anticipation of freed disaster time. I've stopped doing the things I love that made me busy or rather that made me busier in the before times and I've no free time still. Kept busier being reliable for work, punctual for work, productive for work, too busy to actually live. Start and stop, usually time or money, never both, never enough. Time is how I measure 
when I get done for likes and hearts and blue-white thumbs held up. The filter setting that tries in vain to capture the moment of my accomplishment, time that I should have relished, I should have reveled in, the sticky, the sticky grittiness of sliced pears with too much time on their skin. I'm going to read from my debut collection, um, Eat Salt, Gaze at the Ocean. Here, it's not the same ocean, I know, but ocean is ocean and it's salty. You still have to watery squint your eyes when the sun blazing scorches the surface, shimmers, the horizon sifts. It's still the same sound pattern of the recede. Come in, recede further, come in again. The sound of pressure builds, crashes, pounds. The tug and insistent pull when you're in tune with the ocean, sink toes, this land borrowed far from another, this constant familiar uneasiness. How to write about what you carry but don't know, strange inheritance one carries, everyday code, understandable if born of Haitian soil, submerged in salt sea, bracing rivers, falls. I start with origins, I was not here, I am not there. Rather, the line from here, today, tethers collective trauma, umbilical, centuries old. Those bones, a bridge over oceans, triangulated passages. Rationalize, trace the origins, collective trauma here, scattered there, no real home, as in what does it matter? It's happened. Zombies, reimagined response, enslavement, etched in bones. Ask mother about zombies, the back home kind. She won't speak except to start and stop. Words caught in her throat. I ask father. I am a man of God. Don't pay attention to such things. Silence. So I ask books from the library, keep them from touching other books or caressed by the same night wind against my back. I ask for help, guidance to write these words, offer a prayer, remembering, give thanks before asking favors. Zombie, zombification process, de-zombification, Haitian zombie, ask the library and the internet, vague and also specific questions, at least 11 different ways. I use quotations, asterisks. I tried zombie, walking dead, even comparative versus salt, ocean, eat salt, reanimation. At night, the pile of library books stay outside my bedroom. Rene de Pest's Hadriana in All My Dreams, Wade Davis's Passage of Darkness. Maybe the books with veve drawings like stick and poke tattoos, their shapes, arrows, draw down the loas to language of gods I don't know. Thank you. Hello again. Um, one of the pleasures of this, this occasion for me, one of the pleasures of this event uh, is being able to introduce or have some hand in welcoming so many poets who I respect for so many different reasons. Um, so many of the poets that you've heard and will hear uh, during this event are not only poets of exceptional skill and craft and dedication, um, but poets who have taken the step to become community builders uh, in their respective communities, uh, poets who have taken on roles of, of mentorship or just overall roles of care within their sphere of influence. And so uh, the next poet that I'd like to introduce you to, Sherry Alexander Hines, uh, is one such poet. You know, uh, she's a person who's been organizing in Ottawa for many years, uh, whose, whose own path as an individual poet uh, has grown and someone whose uh, devotion to the craft, devotion to the path of being a poet um, is something that I've had the pleasure of bearing witness to 
for many, many years as someone who used to live in Ottawa as well. And so um, I'm pleased to call uh, Sherry a friend, pleased to call her a peer and an acquaintance and someone whose presence has been important to me um, as a, as a one-time Ottawa, Ottawa poet, or maybe I'm forever an Ottawa poet, who knows? Um, in any case, um, we were pr privileged and pleased uh, to be able to publish more than one uh, of Sherry's poems, which you will s soon hear. Um, so please enjoy Sherry Alexander Harness. My first poem is called Collecting the Bones. It's published in Guest 9, a journal of guest editors by Above Ground Press, edited by Natalie Hanna. Collecting the Bones. Water. A body alive with dead bodies and bones. Every day I fill my body with your body to survive. I live off the lives of histories in your body. Bubble bodies that float, bounce against my ribcage, scream in me, drown again in me. You collect broken bodies, bones, and their secrets over centuries. Under a sky speckled with bird cries, I sometimes hear you weeping, your voice slate as you wash, 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 cleanse, purify, refine, suck the marrow of these bones and scatter their sins to dry on dead shores. Today, I wake up to your stillness. Perhaps it is the stillness I most fear, preceding the rage I know will spill over to come and carry us away inside your body. Carry us away to collect our bones. Carry us away, collect our bones. And I wrote this poem, um, actually when the floods came, when the floods arrived in Ottawa a couple of years ago. My second poem uh, was published in a chapbook called These Lands, edited by Shailene Knight and published by the League of Canadian Poets to mark Black History Month 2020. The title of the poem is A History of Islands. You are an intersection. Four continents collide in you. Twisted metal, torn bodies, thick layers of rusted blood spreading like an island sunset. Snow is bloodletting. Open wounds emptying from the sky. Hair, we melt into mongrelhood. You people are animals, cannibals. For many years, you feared you had a certain taste for human flesh. One day, long ago, you heard a classmate, Tony, call your friend, John, a neg maon. That night, you asked your father what these words meant. He had a strange look on his face. They mean runaway slaves. They also mean strength and courage in dark times. Unearthing bones makes your own bones crack. Uh, the next poems I'm going to be reading are from my very first collection of poetry called Splinter. The first poem I'm going to be reading is called Jagged Pieces. 
Uh, I grew up uh, in a, I was born and raised in a small fishing village on the island of St. Lucia uh, called Grosley. And Grosley is very well known for a Friday night party. So this poem really is about this Friday night party. Jagged pieces. Jagged, broken beer bottles, litter rum lay streets, mongrels feast on half-eaten chicken bones tossed carelessly. You tilt down the shadowed wasteland, your sheer nightgown trailing after you, your bolums dancing on its train. You pray aloud for all the heathens carousing masses who descend on your village every Friday night to get their fix of sex, booze, and weed. Rum glasses held aloft while hips grind against each other, heat rising in dense, sweet clouds. A young boy leans against a towering speaker. His body jerks with a shuddering bass. You damn him. You damn them all to hell with one burning lash of your tongue, with one cut eye behind your Jackie O sunglasses. Why don't you all go read? I was supposed to be a writer. You walk towards the beach, reciting the gospel of John. The moon lights your path, opens the sea as if you can walk on water. Uh, the next poem I'm going to read is called Gone Daddy. Gone Daddy is actually an ode to my deceased father and I wrote it about, um, it's really about the very last time I saw my father alive. Gone Daddy. I lie next to him, turn my head to kiss his cheek. Don't don't. It hurts. It hurts when you touch me. I stare with clouded eyes at the ceiling. Unspoken words arc the night. Return to earth to unknot their syllables. Daddy, I love you. I love you too. Like hibiscus drenched in rain, my heart blooms. He lies quietly, his breath fluttering. And um, the next poem I'm going to read from Splendor is called She. One. She walks as if she has sunshine between her legs. Two, her belly is full of memories. Three, her memories have eyes. Four, she feels the touch of his eyes on her lips. Five, his smile awakens the hidden sun in her heart. Six. She no longer trusts beautiful smiles. Seven. Beautiful, he calls her before he punches her in her face. Eight. She paints over her bruises with the brushstrokes of an artist. Nine, she remembers the distant happy times before quarrels and beatings. 
10. She used to feel safe and warm in his arms. 11. He tastes of loneliness. 12. She wraps her loneliness around her. It keeps her safe and warm. 13. He beat the sun out of her. The final poem is called Bloodless, and this poem appears in Arc 96. It is an ode to my deceased aunt, who I was very, very close to. And um, it took me a very long time. I mean, she died decades ago, but it has taken me this long, really, to write a poem about her death. And um, her death actually was the f one of the very first murder robberies um, in St. Lucia. Bloodless. One. The day you receive the phone call from your grandfather, you wake up to the weeping of Nearer, my God, to thee. That hymn sang only at funerals in your childhood village. You're in your room in the university residence. Someone shouts out your name from the hallway to take the call. You recall running into the hallway, wondering who was calling you. You rarely receive calls. Rising like tormented Atlantic waves, your grandfather's first words pound you, submerge you. You don't remember hearing the rest of his words. Two, your aunt swells with barren promises. She turns away as she tells you she can never have a child until he comes along, a swagger in his hips, deceit on his lips. She knows him, everyone knows him, this saga boy from the village. His seeds have taken root across the island. She lifts her head to look at you as she tells you she's pregnant. A smile lights up like a kerosene lamp. But each night she prays for forgiveness, falls on her knees at her bedside. Her tongue and lips are beaded with Hail Mary's. Father who takes away the sins of the world, grant me mercy for I have sinned. Wash away this sin and cleanse me, that I may be worthy to come before you once more. Amen. Three. Each day, your aunt's belly grows like a new morning. Four. When you return home for the funeral, your mother tells you how your aunt was murdered. How two masked men come at night with guns. Your aunt is there with her new baby girl cradled in her arms. The baby is quiet, asleep. How one of them points the gun at your aunt. One bullet. Her scream is an orphaned soul wrenched from her. How her baby wails, a lament to a deaf night sky. Your mother says, 
there was hardly any blood. Thank you.